Hey what's up YouTube? I feel like the mindset of the best Clash Royale players is somewhat gatekept for some reason. It isn't openly talked about and I don't see anyone mentioning what it is you should be thinking about during your games. So during this video I'm going to be uncovering some of these secrets and discussing things like cycle, evolutions, elixir count and game strategy. I'll leave these four sections timestamped down below and if after the video you have any questions I'll be answering any of them in the comments. So the first thing I want to talk about is what it is top players are thinking about right at the start of the game and I've narrowed it down to two specific things. The first is cycle and the second is opening place. When it comes to cycle the first thing top players are looking for is trying to identify what the first well, what deck their opponent is playing and what eight cards they have in their deck. And they do that, I mean, both by seeing what the eight cards are being played, that's confirmation, but even before eight cards are played, top players are able to know what decks exist in the meta and what exist in the game, and they can therefore uniquely identify which cards are specific to specific decks, and that helps them identify it with only like two or three cards. I'll give you a quick example, like let's say I play a Hog Rider and then my next card I play is an Ice Golem. I'm sure all of us, 99% of us are thinking 2.6 Hog because there is no other Hog deck that runs Ice Golem and Hog. Okay, it could be some weird like Hog Princess Rocket deck that existed back in the day or it could just be some funky deck. But you want to play your odds and that should be like at the start of the game you want to get a gist for what you think your opponent is playing and then try and get confirmation as quickly as possible. So if, my, if I then played a mini P.E.K.K.A, immediately what my opponent should be thinking is, oh, it's not 2.6, it's probably Hog Rocket with like bats and stuff, um, and no, no building. So that's the first thing, is cycle in that sense. And then the second thing is opening plays. And I've said this in the past, but when it comes to deciding what you should be playing at the start of a game, you shouldn't be thinking about what you should be starting the game off with you should be thinking about what you can't or shouldn't start the game off with. Again, I'll give you another example. If I'm playing 2.6, for example, I don't want to be cycling my Musketeer at the start of the game. Whereas if I've got Skeletons and Ice Spirit, it is not like some correct choice. It doesn't really matter which one I cycle. I mean, usually if you're running Evo Skeletons, it's probably better to cycle those. But again, it's a very tiny difference, neither of which will lose you the game. But if you cycle a Musketeer at the start of the game, it can you lose you the game. And if you want to try and understand, regardless of which deck you play, if you want to understand which cards you should play and which cards you shouldn't play, it's kind of based on two things. The first being counterability and the second being potential spell value. So in the example of the Musketeer, if I play a Musketeer and my opponent is smart and he's thinking about it, let's say he's also running Dagger Duchess. My Musketeer, if it crosses the bridge, then the Dagger Duchess fully counters the Musketeer apart from, I think, one one shot on the tower, which isn't that much damage. So four elixir for one shot on the tower, my opponent could then decide, okay, how about I just go really aggressive opposite lane, force out a bunch of elixir for my opponent so that he can't support the Musketeer, and then that Musketeer gets countered for either zero elixir or full countered with skeletons or ice spirit or something. So. That's something a smart opponent would do, is that if Musketeer is very easy to counter, and so you don't really want to start the game off by playing it. The second thing that I mentioned was potential spell value. Now, it's not always the case that you go Musketeer in the back and your opponent's going to have a minor and a balloon, because minor balloon up as a lane. That's pretty unlikely, um, there's just too many decks in the game. What's far more likely is your opponent will cycle a big spell, like a fireball, a rocket, a lightning, a poison, most decks nowadays run at least one big spell and you're just giving your opponent free value on both your tower and on your musketeer or on whatever troop you've cycled for free let's say they poison for example that's a four for four trade but now your opponent also gets poison damage on your tower so why would you play that so that's those two things uh counterability and potential spell value are the two factors you need to think about when deciding which cards you can cycle and which cards you can't cycle Another thing that top players think about right at the start of the game is 3 card versus 4 card cycle. So once they've seen a couple cards that their opponent has played and they've somewhat identified either the exact deck or they at least know roughly what the deck is, maybe they don't know if the opponent is running with a bar barrel or log, like small spells, but they mostly know what the cards are. The next thing that they have to identify is, for example, if your opponent is 
has got three card or four card cycle, especially at the start. I'll give you the most common example right now is with this Drill Evo Bomber Little Prince deck, where it's very common an opponent will start the game off by going Little Prince in the back, they'll cycle a bomber, and because they have three card cycle instead of four, they'll get back to their bomber very, very quickly, and they'll like go for a minor or a drill and very aggressively have an evolution bomber within the first 40 seconds of the game. Um, if you guys are wondering, I'll quickly explain what four card cycle just means when you play a card on the field, you have to then cycle four more cards before you get that original card back in your start back in your hand. If you have champions, because you cannot have two champions in the field at the same time, or you can't have more than one of the same champions, I mean. um, your cycle turns to three instead of four. So once you play a card, you only have to play three more cards before you get that original card back in your hand. Let's say I go for a hog, I then only have to go Skeleton's Log Ice Spirit before I'm back to another hog, so long as I have a champion on the field. Um, so that's another thing that these top players are looking out for, is just keeping track of three card versus four card cycle. And generally, this isn't specific to the start of the game, but I'll just talk about cycle in general. Throughout the course of a game, what is it you should be keeping track of? What part of your opponent's cycle should you be keeping track of? Now, it does depend on the deck you're playing, on how essential it is to keep track of things, but almost regardless of which deck you play, you need to keep track of, for sure, your opponent's win condition and your opponent's counters to your win condition. So, let's say I'm playing some like 2.6 deck and I'm playing against Lava Hound, Lava Loon. Classic Lava Loon, let's say. I know Classic Lava Loon, the counters they have to my Hog Rider are Tombstone and Barbarians. And I need to keep track of those in my head. And my opponent should be keeping track of my Hog Rider, right, because that's my win condition. Um, so these are the things that these top players are keeping track of. If you're playing things like Expo, everything basically counters an Expo. So like even support troops like Musketeers are used to kill Expos, e wizards. So you've kind of got to keep track of even more cards, uh, which is why I think Expo is slightly harder to play at a high level. But that's essentially what you need to be keeping track of and what these top players do keep track of is their opponent's win condition and their counters to your win condition. Um, so yeah. Now before I go on to talk about evolutions, elixir and strategy, I just want to ask you guys a favor. If you haven't subscribed, please do click the subscribe button below. If you're enjoying the video, also maybe hit the like button as well. But with that being said, let's go on and talk about evolutions. I've talked about cycle and what it is you should, what it is these top players keep track of when it comes to cycle. But for the last year, roughly now, we've had something new to the game, which is evolutions. And now we have not just one, but two evolutions. So the skill ceiling has kind of risen, where now, to really be the best players, you need to be keeping track of their cycle, but also the cycle of their evolutions. So I said before, for example, in the Lava Hound example, I, was, I gave the example of Tombstone and Barbarians. But now there's such thing as Evo Barbarians, and the count ways in which you counter that is different. So my opponent might go for a Tombstone to defend my first hog, and he might go for Barbarians to defend my second hog. But that next next hog, so the fourth one that I play, that he'll use Barbarians, that's going to be an Evolution Barbarians he's going to play. So a simple Fireball won't do, I'd have to go for a hog plus log plus Fireball if I ever wanted any damage on his tower. So that's another thing top players are really good at keeping track of, is keeping track of your opponent's cycle and making plays accordingly. Now a general rule of thumb is when your opponent has these evolutions, because they have such crazy stat buffs, and even though these are getting nerfed, they just have crazy abilities um, in general, whether it's extra range or just extra damage or whatever it is, uh, splash damage, multiple bouncing like Evo Bomber. Regardless of what it is, in general, you just you want to be more passive when you know your opponent has evolutions in hand. The reason being, if you go in really aggressive, more than likely you're giving your opponent a lot more value than he should be getting with the evolutions. Say for example, I'm, I'm running, um, I go for like a hog rider at the bridge, and I go for like some crazy prediction log, prediction fireball, whatever it is, but my opponent just goes for, let's just say, evo archers. Evo Archers do immense amount of damage to a Hog Rider, where they can basically just ignore it and maybe get let my Hog get one hit, and then their Archers just got so much value, whereas normal Archers, if they weren't ever evolved, my Hog would get like four or five hits or something. It would get lo loads more damage. 
Um, and so that's why it's better just to wait for your opponent to play the evolution archers and just defend them and try not to give them value than going really, really aggressive. Um, unless there's like a certain play you have in mind that you think will work. So let's say you, you go for a hog rider and you know they have Evo barbs and if you can win the game if you go for a prediction log prediction fireball, then in that case it makes some sense to do it. But in general, a general rule of thumb is to be a bit more passive. And, I mean, based on everything I've said, it kind of makes sense also that these top players are able to make predictive plays, like the one I just explained. They're able to make predictive plays based on the evolution cycle of their opponent and what evolutions they have. So that's another thing. All of this is all these mental gymnastics all going on at the same time um, for top players. And it's a practice-developed skill, something that just happens over time that you practice and get used to. It's kind of also pattern recognition. Um, that's how you get better at, at Clash Royale and the mentality that you're meant to have. The next thing I want to quickly mention is Elixir. Now, I get asked this so frequently, is that should I be keeping track of Elixir? And the answer is both yes and no. The, it's more no than yes, I'll say that. When it comes to Elixir, if you ask any top player at some random moment in the game exactly how much the opponent's Elixir is, most likely they can't consistently always tell you but if you ask them and you give them a range or plus or minus one elixir they'll almost always be able to tell you which means they have a general gist as you keep playing the game as you understand how much elixir each card costs and as you get even better at the game you understand how much elixir each push costs you start realizing um, or you start just intuitively knowing how much elixir your opponent has and not so much specifically like they have 6 or they have 3 or they have 8 or whatever it is. You start knowing whether they have enough elixir or whether they don't have enough elixir for whatever push you're trying to make. So usually you can say, oh they're low on elixir, which, you know, maybe that means 2 or 3 elixir or something like that. Because you know that they've spent a lot of elixir. And when it comes to overcommitting with elixir, I mean the most common form of overcommitment in the game, bar none, is spells. I mean, you go for an Ice Golem Hog, then maybe that's fine, but then you also chuck a Fireball onto an E-Wiz and then you lose because he supports the E-Wiz with like a P.E.K.K.A and then goes Ghost Battle Ram or something and you just lose. You've got to be careful not to overcommit with spells, and that's something that I think pros are extremely good at, is that they don't overcommit and overuse their spells. Even on defense, you don't want to be using your spell because you don't get a troop. You want to be only using, and it's more big spells than small spells, but you don't want to have to rely on fireball for these big pushes. You much rather defend them with troops, um, progressing your cycle at the same time. So that's really all there is to say about elixir: is that you don't need to know exactly how much elixir the opponent has. It's far, far more important to focus on card cycle than elixir cost exactly, or how much elixir they have. And in general, you want to try if you get to the highest level, you want to try and understand roughly what their elixir is like whether they're low or low on elixir or not but that's just something that comes with time to be honest and then the final thing i want to talk about is strategy now strategy can be broken up into two parts both micro and macro when it comes to micro strategy that what that means is like tile placement and timing so when you have a push the timing of when you should deploy your troops in the certain tiles you should play them in in order to defend how you do this I'll let you in on a little secret, almost 0% of your brain is focusing on this when you're actually playing the game. It's almost just purely subconscious and it's all just practice. Maybe if you're newer to the game and you're still trying to get better, you start to have to try and think about, oh I need to play my Ice Spirit here, I need to play my Musketeer here, I need to play my Ghost here. A lot of the stuff you just react to intuitively and you kind of just know how to defend because either these top players have played so many games they know, or at the same time they've also studied and they've watched other players defend these pushes and they just, you know how to defend these big pushes. Um, you've broken it down um, even before the game, like you've done the work before you've even gotten there. And it really just comes to experience, you just play enough that you know, oh going for a cannon against a golem that's not enough, I need more stuff, I need a log or a musketeer and other stuff. Um, what really, the other part of the strategy is macro strategy, that's like some examples of macro strategy are, you know, trying to chip your opponents out slowly or at some point in the game maybe I should change lanes or trying to go to the opposite lane in the, in the lane in which they're trying to get damage. These are all ideas of macro strategy and this is really what top players are thinking about 
I mean, apart from the, the majority of their brain power is going towards keeping track of cycle and evolution cycle, because you just can never forget. Like, you mess up once, and that could be the difference between you winning and losing. But when they when there's like, you know, when there's like that dead time in the middle of a Clash Royale game where you're both getting back your elixir, in those, in those moments where they like gather their thoughts, they're thinking about strategy, okay, should I go opposite lane now? Is it okay if I change lanes? Do I really want to be going same lane as him? Or should I be trying to go same lane as him? Should I be trying to, you know, bait out some cards or like th things like this? These are like examples of macro strategy. And these are things that also come from experience. I'll be making videos on this in the future on like game strategy on a macro level for different matchups for Hog. But that's kind of what it comes down to. I'll give a quick example just so you guys can understand. Is let's say I'm playing Hoggy Q versus Splashyard, right? Splashard, the way in which they make their pushes is they keep cycling cards in one lane and they build up a lot of support groups and then they chuck a graveyard at the same time and you're going to struggle a lot defending both the graveyard on your tower and the support troops um, that are at the bridge, be it like Knight, Baby Dragon, Evo Bomber, stuff like this. So the way in which your game strategy is that you should already know this before you get into the game but when you're playing against Splashard you want to be thinking okay as much as possible, I want to be trying to go opposite lane. Why? Because then you can split up their resources. You can split up the fact that they have to now use some support troops in the opposite lane as the lane they want to get damage in. Which means it'll be much easier for you to counter, for your towers to counter the support troops and then target onto the graveyard. So, that's an example of a macro strategy tip that you shouldn't be trying to figure that out in the game. Um, you want to, at the highest level, they already know this, that I can't be going same lane, I need to change. Um, I need to be going opposite lane, for example. Or, some matchups you want to be going same lane. If you're, if you're a Lava Hound player, I know often Lava Hound players want to be going same lane as the Cycle players. So, and actually even in the case of this uh, Splash Shard versus Hog, the Splash Shard player's mindset should be, I want to go same lane as the um, as the Hog, Hog EQ player. So, yeah, the, these are, I think that's in general what I wanted to cover in this video, of the general tips that um, these top players, well, how, or the general mentality these top players have when they're playing. Um, in this video we covered Cycle, Evolutions, Elixir, and Strategy, and those are really the four biggest things that you're keeping track of in your head. It's, it's very difficult to do, and it is something that takes a lot of practice, and maybe it seems impossible to some of you, but I, I would, if you're asking me what I think you should focus on, I would say without a question or shadow of a doubt you should be focusing on keeping track of Card Cycle. Just try your best to develop that as your first skill and forget evolution cycle. I mean, to some extent, keep track of evolution cycle, but forget elixir. Don't try and say, oh, they have five elixir. He just played a, you know, a bar barrel. Now he's at, what, three elixir. Just, just don't try and keep track of these mental gymnastics. You'll just confuse yourself. In real time, you just want to be keep tracking of what cards are they playing? What cards have they played? And therefore, what cards do they have? But yeah, I hope you guys found this video useful. Again, if you guys aren't subbed, please do click the subscribe button to help support this channel. Um, I hope you guys found the video helpful and informative. And uh, yeah, I'll be making more videos as always. And I hope to see you guys uh, in my live streams as well. You can check them out. I stream at 8.30 p.m. GMT uh, most days. So go ahead, check that out. And that being said, I'll see you guys in my next video. Have a good one. Bye.